Thank you, yes. Thank you Wonderful. for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I should say that, um, so my association is diverting a little bit from its usual um, operations because of COVID and the urgency of acting in that space. So um, just a quick introduction to me first. So I'm the director of Personal Data IO and board member at My Data Global, um, as, was, as was mentioned. Uh, by training, I'm a mathematician. Uh, so I'm neither an epidemiologist or a lawyer or all of the other relevant things. And I think that will show at some point. So what I would like to talk to you today about is my journey in understanding the civil liberties impact um, of COVID, starting from the science and trying to uh, preempt or to anticipate as much as possible how governments might react to this situation. Um, so it will be sp split into many different um, intermediate steps. And I think this is important to explain um, my thinking and why I'm doing things that might be very surprising for this open rights group community. And then I want to talk about the PEP project, which I'll just call PEP for simplicity uh, of pronunciation. <laughs> and then mention a quick survey of existing science that might be relevant to assessing how to do contact tracing in the right way, as was just mentioned by Edin. Um, just at the at the end of the during the questions. So first, what I did, and the, you will see a lot of those links dropped in the in the in the slides if you're interested. So what I did is read as much as possible of the research that was coming out of China to first, of course, uh, try to protect my family as we didn't really know what was going on at the time. Try to understand as much as I could, as fast as I could, about the virus, but also um, trying to preempt. The, the developments in terms of surveillance that were already mentioned today. So one very important graph in one of those, um, those papers is this one that is coming out of Oxford that shows that basically to summarize, um, around half of the infections are occurring in the light blue zone, which is pre-symptomatic, and the other half in the dark blue is occurring um, after the onset of symptoms. Now that is extremely significant because short of quarantining everyone or confining everyone like we're doing right now in many countries, it means that we have to have an, an ability to find the light blue um, individuals, the ones that are pre-symptomatic but already infecting um, someone. And so that is a real challenge and it's a real challenge that can be addressed. I mean, the, the challenge is to go back in time in a sense to try to find other people that you might have infected that are about to become infectious but are, don't have yet symptoms. And this is a challenge that can be addressed through technology. So this would be the scenario. This is contact tracing that was just mentioned earlier. Um, you have an individual, subject A, that has an infection but is not showing any symptoms and is walking about their day, day one, going home, train, work, home again, and potentially infecting a ton of people. But on day two, they realize, oh, I have some symptoms, let me do a test in this ideal world where there are enough tests. That person um, is found to be positive and so instantly signals to all of their um, contacts over the past X days, it might be one, it might be all the way to 14, and um, contacts those people and tells them you are at risk. And then those people in turn do tests and they might need to be isolated depending on all kinds of criteria determined by ideally science, but not necessarily. Um, so this is the theory of contact tracing, which could occur in many different ways. It could be done manually. It has been done manually in China, for instance, with 1500, 1500 teams of five epidemiologists tracking individuals, but it can also be done um, with apps and with digital tools. And so this is the proposal that is coming out first out of Oxford, this analysis saying, let's build an app. Now, the science is pretty compelling to say that at some point we'll need some form of walking back in time, as I called it. So this ability of going back through past contacts. To me, at least, this is fairly certain. It is fairly certain that we'll need to be able to do this. And we need to put this in the context of other frameworks that exist that might inform our thinking here. And for instance, the WHO guidelines that individuals have an obligation to contribute to surveillance when reliable, valid, complete data sets are required and relevant protection is in place. Under those circumstances, informed consent is not ethically um, required. 
So this is from WHO guidelines. Um, and in particular, this one is in the one on the left, WHO guidelines on ethical issues in public health surveillance. One of the authors of these guidelines is Michele Loy, a friend of mine and co-author. And as I was talking to him and trying to explain um, the science that I was progressively understanding here, um, we arrived to an understanding that it was important for the privacy rights community to react to this and to figure out a different model than this, this surveillance. Okay, we have a moral obligation to engage in surveillance. Let's admit that then what is the model we have that is not state mandated surveillance? And so we thought about it and he wrote um, uh, an article outlining his uh, ethical thinking in, those, in, those, uh, in this area. And that got picked up by different actors. For instance, Christian de Kuna, for those of, who, for those of you who know him, who is uh, the former head of the private office of the European Data Protection Supervisor. Um, and so this, this, I think, contributed to a broader understanding of the issues around surveillance in this very particular context. Now, with this knowledge, I started reaching out to the MyData community. The MyData community is a community focused on um, individual rights, actionable rights under the GDPR and other laws, um, in particular, the right to portability. And it's focused on on making sure that the value of um, personal data is fairly distributed, based often on consent um, frameworks, knowing full well that those consent frameworks can often be abused. And so with this ethical understanding, I started reaching out to the MyData community and tried to promote this idea of a MyData commons, a commons where we could donate data or we could entrust the data, um, a commons that is constituted in some legal way, that would be governed by strong standards and strong values um, in order to enable academics, governments, maybe journalists to better inform the general public on how to do, um, how, to, how to react to this crisis. Um, and also, of course, individuals would be informed themselves. The idea was to involve the MyData community in building a governance framework and then involve more and more industry players and more and more um, developers to contribute to this, to this uh, ecosystem of apps that would be based around the same governance framework. Now, one of the apps that resulted from this legal framework that we started building, this ethical framework that we started building, um, through basically a checklist for app development, was this app called WeTrace. So WeTrace is a privacy focused, as they say, mobile COVID-19 tracing app. So it uses Bluetooth, Bluetooth um, and decentralized asymmetric uh, uh, encryption to do contact tracing. So it leverages the fact that Bluetooth is a very distributed um, protocol to build, if you want, a whole stack um, of distributed const contact tracing. So it was built in a sense to the highest standards that we could see of privacy uh, for preserving privacy. It was built by partly Google engineers and Swiss bank engineers. Um, it was extremely surprising because everything I'm describing here happened within 10 days or so. Now, this is an example of an app that was built. Um, now I want to switch to an, uh, a more focused understanding of what comes into play in designing those contact tracing apps, because the reality is that I suspect many governments are about to roll out those apps in Europe, um, including in the UK, in Germany, in France, in Italy, and so on. So the necessity and the proportionality of those, of those contact tracing apps should be assessed based on legal tests. And I'm not a lawyer, but in order to assess whether these are proportional or necessary, these assessments should be informed uh, by science. One of the ways to take a shortcut in doing this assessment is to do it comparatively, to see opposing alternative solutions and to compare and assess which are better than the other. Um, this is a way to quickly say, well, instead of using this solution, we could use that one. And so you can see here at this URL that I give you there, a bunch of different apps um, sorted according to criteria to, to evaluate in this, in this framework of, um, in, in this privacy framework. Now, one particular um, 
framework I want to talk about, or it's, it's not really an app, it's, it's a software development kit for building apps, is this PEP system. So the Pan-European Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing Project. I want to talk about it because it seems to start um, making the moves to become the, the European standard for doing those things. Why? Um, one of the reasons is that it has really top universities contributing to this, this project. This is a large alliance of many large universities in France and Switzerland and Germany, uh, mostly. So I want, before talking more in detail about what PEP is doing, I want to assert a few disclaimers. The first one is that I know for a fact that PEP is shifting some elements of what they are doing. They're changing their approach to doing some of those things, and that should be taken into consideration. At the same time, they're presenting an air of inevitability to all of, that, what, all of what they are doing. Lots of governments are rallying between that framework, yet no code is released at the moment. It, no one is able to independently assess how good they, their privacy framework is. So it could be, of course, that things are improved behind the scenes. It could be that they are not. Um, what I'm doing here is describing things as they stand based on the, as much information I was able to obtain. The motivation is to make sure that the privacy community can quickly mobilize in um, asserting what is important in such a framework when it is deployed. So one of the key statements by, um, by, uh, by PEP is this one, or privacy core. Anything we provide is based on voluntary participation, provides anonymity, does not use personal data, nor geolocation on information, operates in full compliance with GDPR, and has been certified and tested by security professionals. This echoes what Josh, Jeff was saying earlier. The claim that this does not use personal data is false, given, as we will see, that some indivi individual level data is still centralized. My argument to, to say this is based on what's called the Briar case on dynamic IPs and internet service providers. In the judgment of the Court of Justice of the European Union, data is not personal data if, the, if there is a legal means which enable to identify the individual associated to that identifier. In the current circumstances, there exists all those means. A state could force a centralized entity to reveal who is the individual behind an identifier. And this is one of the key arguments in saying that PEP is not, is overstepping in claiming uh, GDPR compliance through purely technical means. So to, to be more specific, PEP asserts that it's possible to construct a technical infrastructure that would guarantee compliance while deployed by governments. This is a misunderstanding of the misalignment of the threat models between the legal and the privacy tech standpoints. There are questions to be asked, for instance, what if an unsavory government start joining this coalition of governments that would implement the PEP framework? What if some governments were using the same technical infrastructure of anonymization for other purposes than contact tracing in the context of COVID. What is happening here echoes what Jeff was saying, except that it's a framework for anonymizing personal data, really, and for pretending that personal data would be anonymous. And this is even meta dangerous compared to what Jeff was saying. It gives technical cover for governance to pretend that some data is anonymous data, and, all, and it also assumes, this is up there in the voluntary participation, that all deployments of their tech will be consent-based. This is not necessarily the case. So it bundles many different things together, which are problematic. So to highlight this, I would like to, to, to take from their own website, um, this event that should happen in their protocol when a user receives a code saying that they've tested positive. Then the user can voluntarily provide information to the National Trust Service that permits the notification of the apps recorded in the proximity history and um, who thus might be potentially infected. So in an FBI versus Apple scenario, the go a government would have all the means to identify the individual who might have been infected. And this is dangerous. The, there is an extra sentence here that is totally irrelevant to the concern I'm phrasing, that this history contains anonymous identifiers, so neither person can be aware of the other's identity. 
that's not relevant. The threat here would be a government trying to get to this data. So in, with this idea of comparing different solutions, I would like to contrast two different solutions, or a, a three really, but um, the, these are three different options. And really option two and option three are the alternatives that I want to consider here. If you do this little correction in the top right, instead of each user gets a random ID that the government knows, and instead replace it by each user could get a random, gets a random ID that the government could figure out in an FBI versus Apple scenario, then you're exactly in the threat model of PEP in the top right. And as it said there, third parties can track people, but the government can. Now, in the, on the, the third option is pushed by another initiative called COVID Watch, developed at Stanford. And now associated with WeTrace, this app that I mentioned earlier that was doing things with a more decentralized stack. And in this system of simultaneously asymmetric encryption and complete or a more decentralized stack based on the fact that the Bluetooth protocol enables that, then in this situation, the data is much more decentralized and there is a lot less risk. Now, you can ask yourself, given all the industrial partners that are involved, why would they choose a suboptimal solution? Or if, sorry, all the academic partners that are involved, why would they choose a, a suboptimal solution? Now, this is pure speculation on my part, but you have to take into account many different effects here. The first one is the structuring effect of the app stores, the Google and Apple. They've decided that they're rejecting coronavirus apps that aren't from health organizations or from governments. That makes it very unlikely for one scientist to be able to develop an app that would be useful in this context. You have to have a coalition of scientists that would address a, a government or a set of governments. So they have a necessity to provide governments access to get the buy-in that they need in order to get to the app store. And there is also a necessity to solve the political problem of cross-border interoperability. So this creates new problems in terms of, um, of possibly downgrading the protocols they have to use because they might need to satisfy a whole set of government rather than a more privacy conscious government. Now, for addressing the three points above, especially the structuring effect of the App Store, I, there is also a very important element in my view tied to the Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on the right to participate in science. So the right of individuals to also construct scientific tools to assess their own circumstances with respect to COVID. Now, opening the floodgates of anyone being able to build COVID apps is obviously a bad idea, but what I want to highlight here is that it's also a bad idea to gatekeep the apps or to let big technology companies gatekeep the apps that can address COVID, because that ends up giving too much power to governments through pressuring effects on scientists. One other factor that might lead them to choose um, uh, subpar protocols are possibly unrealistic assumptions that they would make on the number of contacts that they would have, that an individual would have day to day. And again, there is a helpful analysis that shows that um, you can quickly compute in the three options that are presented, what would be your bandwidth requirements? And I find that this is very interesting because this shows that depending on where we are in the epidemic, different solutions might be relevant. Or depending on how the solution gets deployed, there might be better choices of centralization or decentralization of architectures. So we can have a data-driven um, mean to argue for some deployments rather than some others. So the main conclusion I want to draw is that the COVID watch solution seems to actually be more appropriate for PEP than, than PEP for their stated intentions. Now, there are many other factors that should enter into a legal analysis. And again, I'm not a legal expert, but I can understand those scientific papers, those epidemiology papers, and see in what direction epidemiologists are going. So I want to highlight two of them. Uh, the first one, beyond R0, the importance of contact tracing when predicting epidemics. Um, what it's basically saying is that one should look beyond the R0, this very simple number, 
to understand how epidemics function. And one should instead look at how epidemics will transfer from one community to the next and should go to, should look at secondary contacts if you want, not just the first contacts that might lead to the next infection. And the second paper is saying exactly the same thing, but in, in, a, very particular, in a very particular way and might be easier to grasp. It's talking about the age distribution family structure and its impact on COVID-19 dynamics. Now this becomes extremely important because it's, what it's saying is that the population is not homogeneous. There is very different communities that exist in our everyday life in the Western world and, and of course elsewhere. But this distribution should be understood before understanding the need for deploying contact tracing apps. So I invite those of you who are interested to join on the forum of Personal Data IO, where I tried to break down with a few other volunteers um, the, the underpinnings of those decisions. I, we are also trying to work with sociologists and medical anthropologists to better understand what is a relevant breakdown into communities to better understand how those this contract tracing should be done, possibly without using digital means. So one final idea to, to loop back on the My Data Commons idea is that one possibility would be that we would build a commons or people would build a commons precisely to collect the data that would become relevant in assessing what is proportionate in deploying those tools. I think this would be important. This would be an important um, citizen effort to better keep in check a coalition of epidemiologists or scientists and governments to dictate life in the very near future or maybe slightly longer future when we get out of COVID. So again, if you're interested, um, I'll be happy to talk about this and I'll be happy to discuss this with you on the forum of personal data IO as well. Thank you.